Airline baggage handler, cargo handler, ramp hand, just some of the monikers carried by those entrusted with getting your luggage to your intended destination. They sort through three letter destination codes, flight numbers, and scan 10 digit barcodes by hand searching for cargo matching their assigned flights. Some airlines are also incorporating RFID tags to track bags in real time to improve accuracy. Whatever methods are used, from the commercial airlines to chartered flights, the intention is to arrive at the same location at the same time as your luggage. Uh, in this episode, we explore the hidden world of what happens to your bags after disappearing behind the wall <laughs> with the airline's logo in this episode of Black Box Down. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Black Box Down. It's Gus and Chris. Hello, Chris. Hi. Sorry, I laughed. Are you intro. ready to talk about bags? <laughs> no, but just like the hidden world. Like, but that, <laughs> it is It is one of those things. Like, you just see it go. And it goes right, the, and only, it, the only time you think about it is when your bags don't arrive wherever it is you're going. You're like, oh, yeah. has, has it ever happened to you? Has your, have your bags ever been lost? Yeah, yeah. Um, or or whenever you're like, well, why haven't the bags come out yet? Or, right, you know, why like is it taking so long? Yeah. I, I think I've only had my bag lost once. Uh, I was flying to Paris and I landed and my bags didn't show up. And I went to the counter and they're like, oh, yeah, your bags are in Munich. <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> that's no good for me. Yeah. <laughs> they delivered it the next day. I think mine was just once whenever um, there's an issue with, I don't know, I think it was like an overbooked flight or something where, or no, no, my flight got uh, reassigned, but my bag was stuck somewhere else. Gotcha. So it wasn't lost. It was just not with me. (laughs) Right. And we've talked in the past before about incident, about how in order for a bag to be put on a plane, the passenger has to be on the plane. In this case, you know, if you get, if the bag doesn't make it on the plane with you, they presume you would have, you know, you're on the plane. They presume you you don't know that your bag is not on the same plane as you. At that point, yeah, you you don't have control over if your bag is on the uh, the plane. Exactly. Exactly. Which is the thing. Yeah, because we talked about that on an episode um, a while back. But yeah, about Mm -hmm. when that rule became a a, a firm rule of of if you can't have bags on a plane that the person is on Typically, whenever I, I've I've been a frequent flyer for many years now, even uh, before like our current job, my previous job I used to have it was a, it was a traveling job. I was always on the road five days out of the week. I was uh, flying around uh, for that job. Uh, so I've I've learned a lot about you know about <laughs> flying and the ways to make it as efficient as possible. Uh, I almost never check a bag. Me uh, it's neither. Very rare. Yeah, it's very rare that I'll check a bag. Normally, it's going to be a really long trip or. On, also, actually, when it's cold, you know, my, mm-hmm. your clothes are a little bulkier. You got to worry about yeah. jackets. And uh, I, I tend to uh, check a bag a little more frequently when it's cold. Um, but anyway, we're, we're distracted. Now we're just talking about bags. Um, <laughs> so the first automated baggage handling system was actually invented by BNP Associates in 1971. And this technology is in use in almost every major airport worldwide today. So this baggage handling system, or BHS, uh, you know, aviation loves acronyms. (laughs) I like Um, it is. It's a type of conveyor system installed in airports that transports checked luggage from ticket counters to areas where the bags can be loaded uh, onto the airplanes. And the BHS also transports checked baggage coming from airplanes over to baggage claims or to an area where the bag can be loaded onto another plane. So you think about it, it's like that's really the route your bag can take, right? It's mm-hmm. going to go from the counter to the plane or from the plane to the baggage uh, claim or from the plane to another plane. Like that's yeah. really the only paths your bag can take. There's almost no other, I can't really think of another route it would take. Like sometimes there's a separate baggage pickup for oversized bags. I'm mm-hmm. sure, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's like off to the side typically from where the main baggage claim is. It'd be like, if yeah, you I think I've seen check it. Something I've really big. never checked anything big (laughs) yeah same here uh most of my stuff's pretty normal size according to verifiedmarketresearch.com the luggage industry was valued at 33.51 billion dollars in 2020 after a decline due to covid restrictions affecting travel and it's projected to reach as high as 70.77 billion dollars by 2028 uh with a annual growth rate of 9.81% between 2021 and 2028. So it's a it's a big industry. Th- this is just like aviation luggage or yeah, just right. like oh my goodness. 
In fact, kind of related to this story, uh, just a couple of weeks ago here in Austin, I saw that the Austin airport, specifically, you know, this, this relates to us, uh, the Austin airport's getting a new baggage handling system. They started upgrading it. I don't know if you probably haven't seen these headlines. I Have mm-hmm. you, Chris? I don't think so. Do you want to take a guess as to how much the Austin airport is paying for their new baggage handling system? Oh, I don't, man. Uh, $40 million. It's $176 million. Oh, my God. God, that's a lot of money for bags, but I guess it's a a billion dollar industry. (laughs) Right, I'm a multi billion dollar. So, you know, here in Austin, the Austin airport opened up in 1999, and, you know, the existing system's been in place ever since then. It's over 20 years old now. The current system at Austin can handle about 1,600 bags per hour. Um, Uh huh. Once they install the new system, so like the new system, it's not like they plop it all in at once, you know, it's kind of like in phases. Um, in the short term, as soon as the new system uh, begins working, it'll bump up to 2,400 bags an hour. So it's like a 50% increase. Oh. And then once the system is fully functional uh, and you know up and running, it'll process up to 4,000 bags an hour. So oh. it's, a, it's, a, yeah. it's really a, a huge increase. To be fair, Austin Airport has been growing a lot. Like our, our, I think our busiest travel days for Austin Airport were, I mean... We're constantly, I feel like, breaking that this year. Yeah, it feels like it's 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 always exceeding itself. In fact, the busiest day ever at the Austin Airport was just October 24th. I have that in front of me as well. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I feel like I read a similar thing. Yeah, and I think the previous record before that was, you know, just like a week before that or, you know, the year before that. It's like it's just constantly breaking yeah. records. So I, just, I, I only mentioned this because... I feel like, you know, giving the dollar figure and talking about the rates at which, you know, our airport uh, processes bags is, you know, is interesting. It gives gives context. Yeah. So I'm going to read a a little uh, snippet here. Okay. Just uh, for for further comparison. Uh, This is from a USA Today report uh, that was titled, The Trip Your Luggage Takes Without You. The (laughs) Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, which is also close to us, and Dallas-Fort Worth is one of the busiest airports in the world. Yeah has 14 miles of conveyors across its five terminals. LAX, you know, LAX, the international terminal there, is the Tom Bradley uh, terminal. It processes about 25,000 outbound bags a day and has three miles of conveyor just for itself. So just the international terminal at LAX has three miles of conveyor belts. And that's like just one. LAX, you know, has a bunch of different uh, terminals. Yeah. So these all sound like really big and impressive, right? Yeah. By contrast... (laughs) Ah. (laughs) the the tiny walla walla regional airport in washington state where Uh there's just four or five round trip flights a day they have 20 feet of conveyor belts in the back (laughs) handling system (laughs) it seems almost i mean still 20 feet is a long ways to carry a bunch of bags but it's (laughs) i presume it's going it's it's just like the section that takes it from the ticket counter to behind the wall and then (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> from like the baggage handling out to the carousel where people pick it up. It's probably just like that, you know? Yeah. And that Eastern Oregon Regional Airport in Pendleton, which offers three round trip dailies uh, to Portland on Boutique Air, bags travel about 25 yards on a private hand-pushed baggage cart, uh, often by the same person that checked you in, uh, according to the airport <laughs> manager, <laughs> Steve Christman. Uh, so not you know, no, no conveyor belts there. The person takes your bag, puts it on a cart, and then pushes it themselves <laughs> uh, out to the plane. So I'm, I'm sure one of the things that, you know, listeners will wonder about is also like uh, security screening. Yeah, that, that's actually something I, I, I've i wondered about. About Like, what's the difference between... Because you see the security screening for your, um, you know, your, your carry-ons. You, right, so yeah, they, I feel like they obviously pass it to the x-ray machine. You're, you're a little more like aware of what happens to it, right? But I always right. wondered, like, what, how, what is that process? Right. Yeah. They, you know, once you, you, you check in your bag and it disappears behind the counter, it gets, you know, checked and screened as well. Just you don't see it. Yeah. And one of the stages that it passes through, it has to pass through the TSA's explosives detection system machine. And of course, you know, we had a significant ramp up in security uh, over the last 20 years. And, you know, this detection machine just, searches for residue or any traces of explosives and will automatically flag uh, luggage that has these traces for further inspection. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it can get a little tricky because, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure if you know this, but, you know, firearms are allowed to be checked in to checked bags with special instructions. 
Hmm. Uh, so yeah, you know, I, I didn't know that, but I had really thought about it, the process of it. Right. And, you know, it makes sense. You know, you can check a firearm because you can't get down to it in flight. Yeah. You know, it's there, but you can't, you know, there's no way for you to get down there to it. But that being said, you know, according to the TSA website, it's very important to know this. This, 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 might, this might save uh, some headache for one of our listeners. According to the TSA website, rocket launchers and flare guns are not allowed. So uh, <laughs> do, not, uh, do not try to check your rocket launcher. Uh, even though you can't use it and you can't get to it, the TSA explicitly says you cannot, uh, you cannot check that. <laughs> I like how they group those together. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine showing up? With, and be like, oh, I just want to put my check back, you know. I didn't yeah, know. No, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. We, we could probably do a whole other episode about, like, in-person TSA security screening. Mm -hmm. I, I saw a story about that the other day where at, I want to say at checkpoints, you know, where you go through before you board a plane. I want to say up until this point in the year, the TSA says they've confiscated like 6,000 guns. Wow. Uh, that like from either on, people, on people's person or in their uh, carry-on bags. That it, and guns are expensive. I, I mean, I've never bought one, but aren't they they're like hundreds? Of, aren't <laughs> yeah, they like, they're, they're expensive. Yeah, yeah. So you know, you and I, I think we're we're kind of the same. We both said that you know we're not really the kind of people who typically check bags. But I'm sure you've been to the airport and you see like someone traveling and they've got a ton of bags. You know, they got the luggage cart and it's just like piled up with bags. Yeah. Carriers like American Airlines actually limit passengers to ten bags when traveling domestic, transatlantic, uh, or transpacific. Uh, and they limit God what's that? who needs more than <laughs> 10 bags. Uh, they limit the bags to five when traveling to or from South America, Central America, Mexico, and the Caribbean. And of course, you you pay for that. You know, obviously you pay for you know uh, yeah. any bag you carry. I don't know if you start to pay more the more bags you have, or if it's like a flat rate per bag, no matter how many you take. I didn't look into that. I'm not <laughs> that I don't travel like that, so I don't know that answer. Man, 10 bags is I guess if you're moving or something, but it seems like there's probably if you're moving across like the world, there's probably other systems to to move your stuff like that that other than checking bags. Well, I will say it is pretty convenient, right? Because mm. the 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 cargo, whatever you're moving, is going with you. You'll have it immediately. You don't have to wait for a delivery person to show up with it. And depending on how much they charge you, it could actually end up being cheaper. You know, a check hmm. bag might cost $50 versus, yeah. you know, if you're shipping something, you know, via FedEx or UPS or whatever, it might cost you way more than that. I've definitely traveled and taken an empty checked bag with me with the intention of buying something wherever I am and then putting it in my check bag to bring it back with me. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've done s s similar where... Um I bring an extra bag with me or, or it's like, I think it was international flight where it's like, I checked a big bag, but then I had a little carry on that I didn't need just stuffed in there just in case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, depending on what you're taking, it, it could make sense from a time uh, perspective as well as mm. uh, financially. I, I, sorry, this, I just, not that I have any need for this, but I just went through, my brain was going through this, like, you know, because Southwest, you get two check bags for free. Yeah. I wonder what the cost of, like, if you were trying to transport stuff of, like, someone buying a flight and just, like, using the flight to transport stuff versus shipping it, of, like, what what the costs involved in that are, you know, like... Oh, I see what you're saying. Like, buying themselves a plane ticket and traveling with it. Yeah. I'm sure it's not cost effective but if you're say you're going you needed to move say you're moving and you're going back and forth a bunch i could see like every trip being like trying to maxim you know making sure to get southwest and maximizing the luggage you bring on right and also you know some airlines if you're a frequent flyer they'll offer you you know a couple of free checked bags as well so That's if true. you do travel a lot you know you could leverage that as well if you're uh if you're making that trip this sounds like the kind of thing i'd want to set up a spreadsheet for you've intrigued me Chris. <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> it's december in texas that means it's just about the perfect weather to be outside as much as possible without having to deal with blistering heat uh, especially in austin there's so many places to explore around town uh, you can experience even more with electric e-bike right now for a limited time you can save up to 250 dollars on their holiday bundle with the purchase of any 3.0 light or premium electric e-bike uh, plus zero percent interest for six months only available now through december 31st i love my electric e-bike 
Uh, I use it as much as possible. In fact, I probably find excuses to make trips just to use my e-bike uh, whenever I can. And it's really opened up a lot to me. A lot of places that are close to me, you know, convenience stores, grocery stores, picking up uh, to-go food at restaurants. And I'm really amazed at how quick it is. It's in some cases, in lots of cases, actually, it's faster for me to take uh, my electric e-bike than to take my car and worry about parking. Parking's a nightmare in Austin. Uh, but you know what is not a nightmare? Just rolling up to uh, the bike rack and locking your bike right by the front door and walking in, getting whatever you need, and then leaving so quickly. Um, I absolutely love it. I think it's great. Uh, and I'm really lazy and out of shape, uh, so I let the electric, electric motor do all the work for me. Absolutely awesome. Uh, electric e-bikes mission is simple. Make everyday e-biking adventures accessible to the masses. They're surprisingly affordable. Definitely the best bang for your buck in the e-bike industry. You can make it your own. Electric e-bikes are customizable and adjustable to fit your lifestyle. Electric e-bikes truly have fantastic features and quality and unbeatable price. Uh, there are 200,000 dedicated riders on the road so far. So start your next adventure with Electric XP 3.0 today. Order now, save up to $250 a special holiday bundle and 0% interest for six months. Uh, just go check it out. Visit electricebikes.com to learn more. That's L E C T R I C E bikes.com. Go check it out. Uh, it's absolutely great. Like, I can't say enough good things about it. Today's episode is sponsored by Masterclass, the destination for online classes on a wide variety of topics, all taught by world class instructors at the top of their fields. You can learn, I don't know, songwriting from John Legend. Business strategy from Bob Iger, uh, how to improve your cooking skills from Gordon Ramsay, top of their fields with over 180 classes from a range of world-class instructors. That thing you've always wanted to learn uh, to do is closer than you think. They've got some really great classes. Uh, like I'm really into science and tech. They've got uh, space exploration with Chris Hadfield. Not that I'm going to go explore space, but I think it's really interesting to hear about. There's a class from Dr. Jane Goodall about conservation. My good friend Bill Nye talks about uh, science and problem solving. Uh, don't those all sound really interesting? You, got it. you really should go check them out. Uh, plus, all master classes are broken out into individual video lessons, usually around 10 minutes long. So if you only got a few minutes, you can still get some learning in. You can also explore lessons across your phone, tablet, Apple TV, computer, uh, on the go with audio mode. And in addition to video lessons, Masterclass provides you with downloadable lesson recaps and supplemental materials like recipes from cooking classes and scripts from writing courses. I highly recommend you check it out. This holiday, give the perfect gift of an annual Masterclass membership and get one free. Go to masterclass.com slash blackboxdown today. That's masterclass.com slash blackboxdown. Terms apply. It's the most festive time of the year and HelloFresh is here to help make the most of every moment. From holiday hosting to dinners during busy weeknights, you can count on HelloFresh to deliver fresh ingredients and seasonal recipes. And if you're looking for a wide variety of options, HelloFresh has over 35 recipes available to choose from each week, so there's something to please everyone. Choose from family-friendly, fit and wholesome, even veggie options. Plus, you can easily customize your meals by swapping proteins or sides or upgrading your proteins or even adding protein to a veggie meal. They're even offering festive eats this holiday season to make mealtime a snap. Choose from holiday-inspired dinner recipes, seasonal add-ons, or even three-course offering, all designed to make holiday meals extra yummy and easier than ever. I look forward to any time I have a HelloFresh box showing up. Um, I like how it's precisely what you need, and it's everything you need. You don't have to worry about like, oh, what am I going to make? What am I going to buy? You've already made the decision, and it shows up. You're done, and everything's there, pre-portioned, so that you don't have to worry about food waste. Plus, I... I I don't know about you. For me, it's a lot of fun. Sit down, 30 minutes, make some food, and then eat it. Plus, it's all really delicious. I love it all. Uh, and if you're traveling over the holidays, not too late to change your delivery preferences to one of HelloFresh's plans that works with your schedule. So go to HelloFresh.com slash BlackBoxDown18 and use code BlackBoxDown18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. That's 18 free meals and free shipping at HelloFresh.com slash BlackBoxDown18 with code BlackBoxDown18. So I don't know if you remember this, uh, but the idea of even charging for checked baggage is a fairly recent development. I don't know, mm -hmm. you know how long you've been traveling. But yeah, yeah. It, was, it was May 2008 when American Airlines announced it would begin charging a fee for all checked bags. And they were the first major U.S. carrier to do so. Uh, and, you know, once they did it, it set off like a domino effect. And then all airlines realized it was like uh, a way that they could make more money. And they all began doing it. Yeah, uh, it used to be that. And that's why like that's a big selling point for Southwest now. You know, it used to be all airlines would offer checked bags as part of your ticket. And now, you know, I, as far as I know, off the top of my head in the United States, Southwest is really the only carrier that still doesn't charge you extra for your checked bags. Had they never charged for checked bags or did they charge and then? I think they never it? have. Because like I said, this it used to be the norm to not yeah. charge. 
And I think when everyone started, when everyone else started charging, Southwest just maintained their policy of uh, of not charging extra. Mm. So there was actually an article on Boston.com. Uh, it was entitled "The Man Behind Bag Fees." Oh, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to, if you want to direct your anger at someone. Uh, apparently, it's an Australian airline consultant named John Thomas. Mm-hmm. He's credited as the person who brought baggage fees to airlines in North America. Uh, he first advised carriers to start charging for check luggage in 2008, setting off a chain reaction that saw one airline after another adopt the charge and opening the floodgates for a steady stream of other new fees. Uh, he attributes the new revenue to saving airlines who are facing rising costs that could have put major operations out of business. And yeah, you know... After September 11th, the airline industry was very disrupted and, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of airlines needed bailing out and they were on the risk of failing or going under. And, you know, this was, this was, I believe, right around the time when they started making that turn, you know, returning to profitability by uh, starting to add all these additional fees that they didn't have before um, to really, um, you know, boost their bottom line. Can I say something I think might be a little controversial? Okay. Uh, I'll I'll allow it, Chris. Uh, I don't think charging for bags is a bad thing. And I say that in that it probably greatly reduces how much stuff people bring onto planes and uh, how much weight people are carrying and makes them pack lighter, which which just decreases like fuel costs and, and is better for the environment. Now you're thinking like an aviation insider. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm sure that, that that's also, you know, part of the calculation that goes into it, uh, is people take less because they don't want to pay for it, mm-hmm. which also reduces the weight, which also reduces the fuel consumption and yeah. airlines spend less on fuel as well. It's like they're making money and also saving money at the same time, yeah. uh, with the addition of these luggage fees. But you and I are the same, Chris, we don't typically, we're not big packers. We don't take a lot when we travel. Yeah. So of course we're both going to think. <laughs> that way you know i'm sure someone who really likes to take a lot of stuff and be prepared they're they're gonna hate well, it and that being said if i'm driving in my car i might pack a lot more stuff because i you know so i think the way i travel when i'm flying i've just i travel efficiently you know i i, mm-hmm. I pack light and tight and and i'm just no i'm like oh i'm not going to check a bag so it's, it's taught me you know which I, I think is like a good way to think it's like well i don't know what how, how what my travel would be like if I if I was checking my because I I hate waiting for it when I get there and mm-hmm. like getting there earlier it's I don't know I've just I've trained myself to just be better at packing so have you ever had to travel with uh, an unusual checked bag or like something that's really out of the ordinary this wasn't an unusual checked bag I think I talked about this on one of our like airplane stories um, whenever we were going to uh, this is whenever me and Carrie were um, going to New Zealand to uh, walk. Uh, we did a, a, people may not uh, have heard of it. We did a, a series called A Simple Walk into Mortar where me and a friend walked from the set of Hobbiton down to Mount Doom in New Zealand. And uh, we had so many, we had an entire bag of batteries. Wow, dangerous. Like, like and I say that as in like we had a camera, you know, it was like a camera bag that had like, we packed all of our batteries for all of our cameras and kind of consolidated. And every, every time we went through security, we, we had, we were like searched because there was, we just had so much like equipment kind of condensed. And yeah. It, yeah. I think that was the most uh, like bizarre and it wasn't that bizarre. It was just batteries, but it was a lot of batteries in a tight spot because we yeah. could, we didn't know if we were going to be able to charge anything at any point because we were right. hiking <laughs> for like, a week. Uh, this is not the episode to really get into it, but that's one of my big fears. Uh, I'm, 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 a, I'm not a nervous flyer, but one of my big fears is a battery fire in flight. Oh, either like a cell phone battery or a laptop mm. battery. So very difficult to extinguish. Very dangerous. Yeah, and I hadn't thought about that, but there's so many batteries. Right, and you and don't it, know if people are mistreating their electronics or what the state of all the batteries are in. It's, it's like, it's like a, a, a silent fear in the back of my mind when I'm, never, when I'm on a plane. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, <laughs> welcome to my terror, Chris. <laughs> but like, and you read about, you know, those cell phones that are, you know, Oh, weird defect that sometimes they explode. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, actually, you're, you're talking about, I think it was like the Samsung galaxy note seven. If I remember right. Uh, I was overseas. I was in South Korea when mm-hmm. uh, they banned that. 
uh, that phone from being on planes. And I remember at when getting on the plane in South Korea, coming back to the United States, like they're making constant announcements that you cannot bring this phone onto the plane. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, both before boarding the plane and then once on the plane, it was a weird time. How inconvenient that must have been if you'd been traveling and in the time from getting on a plane, you had, you were traveling and all of a sudden, like the day Your phone can't go the on the day, plane. The day it got banned, you're like traveling. Wait, what? What? I can't. I can't take my phone. You know, it's so weird. The strangest thing I've ever had to check is, you know, like I mentioned, my old job was a traveling job. I was traveling five days out of the week, and it was, uh, it was in IT. And uh, one day, I was actually in Austin. I wasn't traveling that day, and I had a call from one of our remote locations that uh, one of their servers had died. And I was like, oh man, you know that. It's terrible. You know, I got, well, I got to get them a new server so that they can get, you know, back up and working again. Mm-hmm. And I was like looking online, trying to buy one. And, you know, it was a couple of days before one could get shipped to them. And I just so happened, I had just received a new server at my office in Austin and it was in my office. And this is kind of what you were asking about earlier. <laughs> and I was like, I could fly up there. I could take that server as my checked bag, check it, fly up to the remote location, take it from the airport, install it, and then fly back to Austin. <laughs> and that's what I did. Were you going to have to go there anyway? To install uh, it? No, they had a local staff, but I could uh-huh. go to help, you know, help with the data recovery. There's a lot of stuff going on, you yeah. know, data recovery and the migration and whatnot. So it's like, eh, you know, they could use the extra hand. So <laughs> yeah, I, I remember I, uh, I flew on Southwest, actually. I pulled up, it was a really heavy server. It was like 50 pounds or something in the box. Ooh, that's just the limit. Right. It was like right at the limit. I pulled up curbside at the Austin airport. You know, you can uh, check bags with the sky, uh, curbside uh, and like... I like put my flashers on, <laughs> flagged you know the guys down, uh, checked my bag there, then drove out, left, went, parked my car, and then came back to the airport to get on the plane because <laughs> I, did, <laughs> I didn't want to have to carry the server from the parking yeah. lot all the way to the airport because it was really heavy by yeah. myself. So uh, I, uh, I, I did that. That was the strangest thing I ever had to check. And I remember waiting at the baggage claim and seeing it tumble down. <laughs> uh, oh, you know, but, no. I was like, but it was still in the box. It got shipped in. Okay. In my mind, I was like, well, they ship it like this. So it should be fine. And it was. It worked fine. It worked, worked great. <laughs> Just imagining it. You know, and it's a server. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had to get one of those luggage carts to push it around because uh, I did not want to drag that thing around by myself. Anyway. So, you know, on top of checked bags, there's also carry-on bags. You know, passengers mm-hmm. can bring on um, a carry-on and a personal item that fit within the size limits of about 22 inches by 14 inches by 9 inches on average that can fit into the overhead compartment uh, and under the seat in front of them. They always mm-hmm. say it's one carry-on bag and one personal item. You know, they, the idea is that the carry-on goes in the overhead bin and the personal item fits uh, under the seat in front of you. Yeah. Have you ever been... Uh, pulled aside they, you know at some of those gates they have like the little measuring device and they're like that that bag's too big and they make you stick the bag in the measuring device to make sure it fits have you ever had to do that I, i've done that and i think it was like you know one of those suitcases that you can like z- you you zip it up and it like condenses it yeah where i had to it was like too chonky so i had to um take stuff out some clothes and stuff from my my carry-on and put it into like my backpack with my like you know computer you and to stuff. do shuffle yeah, yeah yeah i had to i had to um i can i this will i can this will fit <laughs> like i can do this <laughs> yeah you gotta wait off to the side yeah um yeah i've definitely had to do that too uh it's it's kind of embarrassing but it's it's vindicating when it does fit i've, I've definitely mm-hmm. been told oh that's too big stick it in like oh look it fits perfect I, <laughs> i'm good i can go i don't have to move anything one caveat there uh i don't uh-huh. think i don't know if a lot of people know this is uh uh, medical devices or medical equipment are exempt from the carry-on limit. Oh. Well, uh, so, good. yeah, like when, personally, when I sleep, I need a, a CPAP machine. Uh, I have sleep apnea. It's like mm-hmm. a mask you put on that, you know, helps make sure that you don't stop breathing while you're asleep. Um, and I've got a separate bag for that when I travel. And I, I can put my CPAP stuff into that bag. And I've got a little tag on it that says, like, medical equipment inside. So oh. I can take my carry-on, my personal item, and my medical equipment. That does not count. Like I, when I first got it, I would try to put my CPAP in my bag. It's like, oh, this is eating up so much space. This sucks. And then I, was, then I realized like, oh, these are exempt. Uh, and every now and then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get on, I'll be getting on the plane and, you know, the person at the gate will be like, oh, you know, you have too many bags and they'll see the tag like, oh, never mind, That's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. I didn't know that. Uh, That's good to know though. Yeah. And I have, a, we have another mutual friend of ours who also uses a CPAP and who did not know that. And I told him 
And uh, he said it's been a game changer for him. So I'm saying that so that <laughs> if any of our listeners have a CPAP or a medical device, you know medical devices are exempt from this. You can get a separate bag to carry that in. Uh, you don't have to have a tag that says medical device inside, but I use it just to avoid having to explain it every time. Mm. Is it is, is it a tag that like that it's given to you, or is it like you just? I just bought it off Amazon for like four bucks or something. That says medical. Mm. Right. It says it all says medical device inside. Uh, I'm I, I am in no way advocating for people to abuse the system. The system is there for people who need medical yeah. devices or need to travel with these things. Um, but yeah, I just got that tag so that. I wouldn't have to constantly like unzip it and show them yeah. and be like, hey, this is, you know, this really is a device that I need and uh, is exempt from the rule. Just a little handy, uh, like travel pro tip. Mm. So uh, we also went ahead and uh, in addition to talking about uh, baggages or baggage handling and baggage systems in general, uh, also pulled a few news stories <laughs> regarding baggage that I wanted to talk about. Okay. Um, this story is uh, a little older. This is from 2011. Uh, this is a, an AP story. During a flight, passengers could hear pounding and screams coming from <laughs> inside the plane. And this is back February 10th, 2011. It oh. turns out a baggage handler was trapped inside the cargo oh, hold of a no. U.S. Airways plane as it was preparing for takeoff. Oh, my. Oh my the New York God. Times reported that the ground worker was inside the cargo compartment when another worker at Washington's Reagan National Airport Closed the door. The, the, the co-pilot told the ground crew to check and the worker was freed unharmed. Because oh you could die in on that, the right? Connecticut. I mean, yeah, if, yeah. If it's not pressurized, yeah, it could, it's going to get really cold and really low on air, really low wow. on oxygen. That's terrifying. Yeah. Uh, so, But luckily, you know, people heard it. I, I can't imagine the terror that guy, the person, I, I don't know that it was a man. I can't imagine the terror that the, the worker <laughs> was experiencing. The door gets closed and it's like, oh, no, like you have to make noise. You have to make sure someone can hear you and, uh, and let you out. Well, it's like th there are those scenes, you know, in movies where someone gets shut in and it's like in, in the back of a truck or something. Right. Or in a, whatever. It's so different on a plane because, yeah, you could die <laughs> just from right yeah there. just from uh typical operations mm. this next one's a, a little more serious but this I, this one i want to talk about just to emphasize how dangerous this equipment can be there was a uh an incident just a couple months ago uh in new orleans i, I want to say it was in late august uh there was a an accident where a baggage handler was unloading bags from a, a frontier airlines flight when her hair got caught in the belt loader oh, and uh, she was, you know, trapped in the machinery and, oh, and killed no. oh as a result God. of it. Oh my uh, God. She was killed. Yeah. Right. Uh, this, I mean, these are big machines, right? They're, they're intended to process hundreds of pounds at a time. So, you know, if they, if a person gets caught in them, it's nothing to the machine. The machine's just going to keep operating. Oh my uh, God. That is terrifying. Uh, that is like some final destination stuff. Yeah, this uh, baggage handler. She was uh, like unloading bags, uh, uh, like on what you know what they call the ramp, and uh, yeah, uh, got caught up in the machinery and uh, and was killed as a result of it. And I think you know people forget about it. Like it's easy to get upset about your bags and you know what's going on, but you know you need to remember that there's actually people working there and that it is very dangerous, not only because of the machinery, but, you know, they may be out walking around, you know, where the airplanes are taxiing and it's, it's a day, it's a very dangerous area all around. You know, people need to be very alert. Uh, uh, otherwise, you know, bad things could happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that is so terrifying. I, I don't know. I, I'm just imagining like if they have emergency scissors or something, you know, like quick cut your yeah. hair off, you know, I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's terrible. And uh, one last news story I wanted to mention here. Uh -huh. This one happened back in 2007. Uh, it involves a, uh, a former baggage handler at the Glasgow airport whose name was John Smeaton. Uh -huh. His nickname was Smeeto. It's a cool nickname. Yeah, he became involved in thwarting a uh, like a terrorist attack. Oh. Uh, back in Glasgow, uh, June 30th, 2007. Uh, he was on break and he noticed two men driving a burning Jeep uh, towards the airport entrance. A uh, burning? He, yeah, he didn't know it at the time, but the Jeep was filled with flammable gas cylinders. Uh, so they were, you know, these people were making an, uh, like a makeshift bomb to try to, you know, drive this flaming Jeep into the airport and have it Holy explode. Holy moly. So um, this baggage handler who was on break, you know, 
heard the, he saw this, heard the explosions. He ran over to help. And it was reported that he shouted an expletive and then kicked one of the attackers in the groin. Oh my God. <laughs> the attacker suffered burns over 90% of his body and later died in the hospital. Smeaton also helped to drag uh, another person, Michael Kerr, away, who had also intervened in the event uh, to safety. Uh, Kern had been left lying with a broken leg beside the burning Jeep after also uh, kicking the attacker. So uh, baggage handler, he, uh, he was busy that day. The hero we needed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What he shouted before kicking the attacker was, F***ing Mon then. What? <laughs> he, what? He, I don't know. Maybe it's a, a, a Scottish saying. <laughs> it was in Glasgow. Uh, but he shouted <laughs> an expletive and then uh, kicked the attacker in the groin. Talk about a, a story. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I thwarted a terrorist attack by kicking, <laughs> by kicking someone in the crotch. I bet he kicked him real hard. Too. you know like man. i bet so but that's it just wanted to kind of give an overview and some uh some information about baggage handling uh and things that happen out of sight i have a question i was okay. thinking about i was thinking about this recently because i was traveling with someone who checked a bag and i don't ever check bags but is there like when your bag comes out of the little tunnel when you land is it if you arrive early is your bag likely to come out later? Like if the be- if the plane lands ahead of time, you mean? Well, okay. So say you show up to the airport really early, uh, and you check your bag. Is are you, is your bag more likely to be at the back of the baggage claim and thus spit out the tube later? Oh, I see what you're you asking. I'm saying like there, it, it's yeah. the first to be packed in the back of the plane, which means it, it it's the last to come out of the plane. There are. There are a lot of variables uh, that go into that. I'm uh-huh. going to say not necessarily because it's not like they take your bag and then immediately load it onto the plane. Like if you show up early, the plane mm. might not be there yet. So they may okay, have to keep yeah. it in a holding area and who knows how it's going to get arranged there. Then once it's taken from the holding area, it's going to get loaded onto uh, a, ca- um, a like cart. A, a cart, yeah, yeah, to get taken out there. So who knows how they're going to get loaded or what order those are going to get loaded on. So there's variability there. Um, some airlines do provide a priority baggage service for their frequent flyers so they may tag certain bags as uh important and you know have them loaded At, last mm. so that they're unloaded first mm. i've definitely seen that if you keep your eye out at the baggage claim you'll often see those tags on uh on some bags they'll, they'll tag they'll tag bags that are heavy and they may tag priority bags as well uh so i'm gonna say no you're pro- if you show up early you're probably not your bag is not necessarily guaranteed to be last to come off just because there's yeah. so many variables that go into getting the bag onto the plane. Hmm. Yeah. Do you have any, any, any other questions about baggage? I, I can talk about baggage forever, Chris. <laughs> uh, I guess one thing I was wondering about is baggage, like stealing, like whatever oh, they, comes, yeah. they spit out. It just seems like people could just grab a bag and walk off. I mean, they could like, how, how is that? Yeah, um, I, I don't have any specific numbers in front of me, uh, but, you know, that does happen. Uh, I know when I was younger, I flew out of the San Antonio airport a, f- a few times. San Antonio's not too far from Austin. And there used to be when you would get your bags down there. This was a long time. I was back uh-huh. in the 90s. When you would get your bags, there was an attendant who would check your baggage claim ticket to make sure mm. it matched what was on the bag. Yeah. Uh, they, don't, they don't do that anymore. Uh, but uh, it is definitely something that happens. I personally, one time... Uh, I was traveling with my wife and she had checked her bag. And when we landed back in Austin, her bag didn't come out. We waited there for a long time and we never saw her bag. But I remember almost everyone from our flight was gone. And I kept seeing one bag go by in the belt that looked very similar to her bag. Oh! And I said, I bet whoever owns that bag took your bag thinking it was theirs. Yep. So we, we, we grabbed that bag, took it home. And eventually we got a call from someone that was like, hey, uh, you know, we we left our contact info in her bag. And we got a call from someone who's like, hey, I got your bag by accident at the Austin airport. It looked very similar to mine. And I was like, I told him, I was like, oh, I figured that happened. I have your bag. Yeah. <laughs> Come by. So <laughs> Let's came, you know, we, a deal. we met up and exchanged bags. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely something that happens. You know, I think making sure that you arrive at the baggage claim, you know, as quickly as you can yeah. and that you're there when the bags are being delivered it helps minimize the chance yeah. of anyone taking your bag i think a lot of times those bags are taken if they've been sitting there for a if, long yeah, time yeah they're going around and no one's like huh right then it, it people see it as a, a as an opportunity yeah um but 
This is a cool. This, this is a, a cool little supplemental episode in between yeah, our main ones. Some- Want to do something a little different. Uh, uh, hopefully people enjoy it. But we will be back next week with another regular episode. And speaking of things a little different, uh, we just recorded um, uh, another premium episode for people who are Rooster Teeth first members or on uh, the uh, you know Black Box Down premium or, or first class uh, who support us uh, directly um, with early episodes and ad-free episodes. And uh, we recorded some... A bonus episode where we uh, talk about uh, a bunch of recent uh, news incidents of, of crashes and things that have happened in the uh, aviation industry recently. And kind of yeah, things that are just it. in the headlines. Um, so if you want to check that out um, or just want to help support Black Box Down and help us make the show, you can go to blackboxdownpod.com and uh, consider signing up. It's, it's just a less than what, a, a coffee a month. Yeah, I think it's uh, two ninety nine a month, uh, yeah. and you can also directly support in uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And I don't know about Spotify, but I believe at least in Apple Podcasts you can get a, a free trial. Oh yeah, that's great. Yeah, and even just doing the free trial is is yeah. So great. if you want to check it out, if you're curious, uh, the options there. Yeah, and for those who already have, um, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Well, like I said, we'll be back next week with another regular episode. Bye. Bye.